Tigers writhings and crocodile leavings, all on a bumpy scene. A river stocked with mad canoes and songs of a toothy mouth. All on a river of unbelieving, bumpy, blue and deep, where none but the brave may brood and slave. This river is asleep. Where without Rawlinson end would madness be? Some calm outlaw collecting his thirst in a hat full of loco water, squinty in a look towards the mountains and in a cup containing the whole sky. I find no fault in myself in this, only salty reason. Sir Geoffrey smoothed his greying and enormous beard with beautifully manicured and white gloved fingers. Rawlinson, he said, we of the Geographic Society think you are the man. What? Drugs? Huh? I always thought your articles were a bit too inspired. We believe there is a tribe, still intact, of Zulus somewhere in the Drakensberg. Brixton? No, Africa. South and up a bit from Johannesburg. We want you to find them. You are the man. I shall go to Zanzibar. Then by Dow to Mombasa. By sea to Durban. And then by Velt on foot to the dragons. Muttered Henry. Grief. That's a nasty cold, said the President. Would you like a tissue? But it's clear from your experience, avarice and love of adventure, medallions and all the rest, said Sir Geoffrey, that you are the ideal man for the job. You mean send a man of my experience out into the land of the Bazoozoos? <laughs> I'd rather go to Brixton. Mind you, if it's for the sake of the colours and the honour of the regiment, and uh, a handsome stipend with fixed bayonet, I would enter the gents at Harrods. This last seemed to conclude the matter. Although Henry's request for a bazooka to bring down the really big sods was turned down on the grounds of diplomacy. But mainly, that Uganda now boasted a royal navy. Unfortunately, this navy defended only Uganda and the Ugandan president's refrigerator. Sir Henry, bum to the log fire, churchilled into a great balloon of brandy. Well, I was in Africa in the 30s. It was a case of mutual respect and plenty of submission. Nowadays, well... Henry took another great slug, two snails, and growled into his balloon. I'm used to quite decent men in the F.O. making mistakes in the kennels at Harrods, but there's something quite wrong with me. I should have boiled the water, or the sweets. Oh, the, the agony. Sometimes a fully-fledged man can think only of his mother, damn it. Henry remembered his mother and preferred not to. She was a woman of great accumulated knowledge and no sagacity, but with a great eruption of intellectual provocation interfered with only by her unusually large moustache. And these sour, soup-dripping walrus imitations taught Henry much about diplomacy, but nothing about manners and intelligence. Often, of a cold night, he would tuck his infant toes into the corners of his blanket or pillow and pray that he would not be kissed that night. His mother was childhood embodiment of Yarmouth. 
he convinced himself, having several times been kissed by this personage, that she was a substitute for the boxing of unpleasant fish, or at best, another way of shaving. His first agreement to a goodnight kiss was predicated on the idea that this would be a soft business. He was wrong. It was an introduction to Germany. Later, he convinced her that depilation with a car battery was not only economic, but also a way of demonstrating the scientific with the cosmetic in quite the most fruitful assignment. He was not a Christian, save in the department of suitable for Sundays, and concluded that an outfit fit only for eating Nicobuch glories. All the same, he looked well enough and continued that shaving soap was a kind of icing that graced the Lord's razor and the manufacturers of bog paper and his mother's chins. For Florrie, real life began when she went to sleep and ended abruptly and dreadfully when she awoke. This was not too surprising. Sharing a night with Sir Henry was not quite the restful night of tranquillity. He was a man notorious in his own bedroom. His stentorian farts, shouts and grumbling in his sleep were most upsetting. Sudden and alarming, he would spring from the sheets to rage horribly against the hun, the nips and Mrs. E's damn chips. And this was scarcely conducive to slumber. Take back the Sudeten land, would you? Take that! You... Here he would thrash the wardrobe. You slit-eyed shit! Burma Railway? It's the bloody unions! Get those filthy congealing things away from me. Dear God, what kind of saint employs a cook who can only bake poultices? Negroes driving London buses? <laughs> Death and I are old friends. You sod! Crocodile tunnels and hippo columns, and the reek of the aloes on the slope, the ranks of the impis and the terrible stabbing spears. By God's trousers, those bold sods knew how to fart. <laughs> Thank Christ I was wearing a snorkel. You never know when your lungs are going to give out in Africa. <laughs> Henry was a man who equated flowers with surrender and wedding. Clashing of the shields and the stamp, stamp, stamp of their damned wogger feet. Frightening in a way. <laughs> Not to a white man, but all the same. Never wear socks, you know, dirty buggers. Polyurethane their feet, a lot of them. I see I has a lot to pay for, in my opinion, including the loss of the empire. But, uh, I'll come to that. Mark you, the development of gloss paint didn't deter me from identifying and knowing every one of my men at any time of day or night. And I do believe the heathens appreciated that kind of gesture. Ah, yes. Those people really liked the personal touch. I'll uh, give you an example. I never travelled anywhere in the dark incontinent without a ruddy great tin of gloss white. This might appear insensitive for a man of my obvious humility, but you see, some of those poor buggers had names completely beyond English pronunciation. And so, to <laughs> their cheery delight, I numbered the sods. In short, the personal touch. Back 
back and front, back and chest. And to make it even more human and individual, I painted the last 27 of my bearers with the letters of our alphabet. A, B, C, um, D, and so on. The last man, ha, huh, you'd ask me that, was a question mark. My God, the whole of South Africa, the whole bloody red world was a part of the empire until we got soft and understanding. <laughs> Damn it. Give a workman an opinion and you might as well give him a rifle. That's what I reckon. A lot of odd bods out there who don't understand democracy. You have to beat it into them. I can remember when any map of the world was read, well, practically, and those bits that weren't, I damn well coloured in myself. <laughs> ah, me. Always the optimist, the great romantic fool. Ah, balls, said Scrotum. Niggers don't know about billiards. Keen on billiards? Up, Sir Henry. Ye gods! Those men chalk their fingers before picking in noses. Ah, tread, dead, the heavy water, quick, slow, quick, the sucking sand, eat stones for breakfast and forget the promised land. put in at East London, where, thank Yezu, I was able to buy <sighs> at inflatable prices another couple of crates of medicinal gin. Horrible stuff made in England, or Angleterre, as we say in Polish. Not many Jews about. Notice that in a passing hallucination. Tell me I was hoping to get a pair of emergency camouflage trousers knocked up. I can knock up your trousers, Buana, said Ubura. Great guns, you're not one of those, are you? <laughs> not surprised the population is dropping. In the bush, I dropped a lot. What? Is much more comfortable, sir. And damn hot. Yebo and Lordy Lord, tip and tip and the sound of guns, said Ubura. Never heard of a mackerel pie and not a drop of rum in the mansion? How the deuce you Johnnies clean your teeth, I don't know. Sell your women to the Sheik of Araby? My God, <laughs> makes me sick to the craw. And for how much? Ten quid a limbas. Big knockers making it the round fifteen. Mmm. 
thousand red bath salts, do you think? Revolting and effeminate. Mind you, women don't seem to do a lot, just the cooking and cleaning up the beastly messes you buggers leave in the hut. Um, how many bath salts did you say? Henry thought of Florence. What for a white woman of impeccable virtue and virginity, I assure you. Many, many baths, sod spoiler. Don't be cheeky with me, you darkened and cheapskate sod. I know many how many bath salts make five. Henry took a giant swig of imported paraffino. And, if essential, I'll climb the big root, shoot the ogre, and bring back the princess that lays the golden eggs. A couple of cans of baked beans and a tin of tuna. <laughs> Don't you worry, I know my Bible. Also, two dozen farm fresh. Funny thing about uh, ogres, we seem to be out of bacon. Makes sense, I suppose. Most giants are Jews or Muslims. Typical. But a whole lot of the giants be in the vegetarians' bus. What? Turnips? Sprouts? Soya sausages, you clod? No, sir. Tuan Saeed Bas Buana. Not the rest of the ridiculous titles what you washed out people want to hear. Many of my family eating exclusively the men what land out of the sky. All little green buggers, sir with big ears and talking about the bars of Mars. With a pinch of oregano and a bit of paprika, well... Well! Graft him. Well, the rest of the world don't want to know. Especially the Western powers. Do you refer, you damned savage, to the Boer War? No, boss. That was the most boring war what I was ever the unwilling victim in. All was regular, sir, and sergeant. Shooting and so on, just shooting and shooting and shitting the family up the proverbial creek. No paddles, but some damn good uniforms. There is justice in this world, said Henry, strangely, wistfully. Democracy, decency, kindness, and the occasional necessary merciful killing. I represent that very kind of kindness. The what? gasped Bura with understandable incredulity. The kind of... I take it you didn't like the uh, beads and calico. Mister, in my country, you am, is, and are the what? Bura rushed into Henry's tent. Bas, Simba, outside Bas. What, you dusky-hided swine? Henry rose in a red rage. His Simbas are quick. The big gun, Saib. A Sambo? I've got eyes in my ruddy head. Grouched Henry, rubbing his face violently to find one he did, and screwed his monocle into it. Now able to see a little, his rage doubled. Damn right! You pass it to me, that gun, immediately, and I'll shoot you on the sodding spot. Now get out of my private quarters, God damn it! I get approximately two erections a year, and some blasted jungle bunny waltzes in to tell me he's a Sambo! Henry glowered through the flap of his tent. What the hell do you think's holding my bloody tent up? My bloody central pole, that's what, now piss off! scraped one paw easily through the canvas of the now sleeping Henry's tent. And at that instant, Henry let off a trouser cough of huge mackerel pie, an immense Billingsgate. But he awoke. By St. Hernia's sacred hankies, I know I'm attractive to women, but a man must have his rest. 
Henry rolled over and released another bum thrump of such nauseous disgust that Simba the lion reeled from his meal, gagged in the guy ropes, and staggered vomiting into the forest. <laughs> grunted Henry. Never did like women who paint their nails. Knew a ship's purser once, who filed his teeth and dyed his eyebrows. Three pink chins and he got the two mixed up. Horrible. Henry Rawlinson lay on his back and went straight, well, almost, I always sleep tight, to sleep. <laughs> Sir Henry had no need of mosquito nets or any of that kind of nonsense. His very breath took care of that nuisance. But in that noisome and restless doze, he experienced the first of many completely asexual dreams concerning Florrie. And more surprisingly even, of old Scrotum. He awoke in a speckled sweat thinking of Rawlinson End. Several months without a letter, or even a crateful of cheer from home, Sir Henry, a man of profound compassion and forgivefulness, tacked a piece of airmail paper to the glistening back of his toilet bearer and directed him to kneel in the desk position. Sadly, the wretched heat and filthy foreign conditions Henry had endured in the African veldt had blunted and dried up his Parker fountain pen. He was forced to write in blood. It was not, of course, his own. And he found 
to his great invention and pleasure, just what a grand inkwell could be improvised from a human ear. Again, it was not his own. His letter was as follows, and it perhaps illuminates a more emotional and unexpected side of Sir Henry Rawlinson. My dearest Florey, it's a bit of a bloody pickle out here. Of course I have killed a lot of things, but that's the good side. I haven't seen a white man since the last time I shaved. Knowing of my deep love for you, would you immediately send me three crates of brandy, several hundred uh, roll mops and a mouth organ. What these sods need is a good nightly rendering of Jollity Farm. Bloody drums and banjos all night long. If I shout at them, they think I'm singing a sodding chorus. And if I shoot one or two, the whole lot of them turn resentful. Huh, <laughs> ridiculous. Pity they don't have a butlins out here. A couple of years in there would knock some sense into them. I would naturally prefer to have my tuba. Bound to get damaged in transit. Some wog had turned it into a cannon. Looking forward to the brandy. Yours, Henry. To waltz without pain is sweet. To tango with Negroes is swell. But celebrate Christmas without your rhyme is a harder thing to carve. Gersimissa had a rather specialised business in things. Send only a portion of hair from any hairy portion of the body, and the same will be returned to yourself in the form of a perfectly matching wig. This will fool all the girls. Our wigs come in complete with a choice of sterilised carpet tanks or the new waterproof wood glues. For some reason beyond his comprehension, he was arraigned, arrested, and had to flee. Not only from South Africa, but from his whole family and happy customers. Was good for the whole bald human race? And then I sure had to rest for the border, leaving behind my wife, 17 kids, and that damn good business. Many aspects. Gosimus was very much like Henry. It was only that, as yet, in the pursuit of finance, Henry had not so far had need to scalp anybody. When Gosu Mercer first lifted the ponderous porcelain weight of Henry's throne onto his head, he was the proudest man on the expedition. The field toilet was as huge as an elephant's foot. In Durban, Gossumosa had polished the brass and mahogany seat to a fine gloss that matched his own cheeks. But now the sun had robbed the wood of its sheen and the acid drops of vultures greened the metal. He remembered the words of Baba Sir Henry the Windbreaker, the breaker of winds, that he, Gossumosa, was the bearer after the brandy bearer and the gun. The most vital piece of a gentleman's equipment in all of Africa. Most of the boys were Afrikaans speaking, as were the shield bearers, the privy seal, who stood in a square about the throne when Henry did what he had to do. He called them the inner truth. Whilst polishing the mahogany and brass of Sir Henry's field toilet, Gosmosa had time to ponder on this. It is not true that the shortest line is always straight. Gosmosa 
knew this now to be true. From the many times he'd held the porcelain in front of his swaying master. The Fuhrer of Rawlinson End had a bladder like a zeppelin, but an aim like the rapid escape of a serpent. As consequence, Gosumos's hair was quite straight and his skin so bleached, were it not for his nostrils, he could pass for a German tourist. When white gloss painted number seven reported that the Induna of what was undoubtedly a very large impi had been surveying the expedition for several days, Henry demanded to know what were the size of the thing's horns, since he'd never heard of the animal. Being told that the horns of the Zulu impi were very large indeed, Henry declared he would bag the bugger in the morning and use it as a hat stand was in light of this unfortunate misunderstanding, an impi being a highly trained Zulu regiment of ferocious endeavour and initiative, that in the light of that mid-African morning, Henry, after several great gulps of rum, found himself awake outside his tent on the aloe-scented hills, quite alone, save for the ever-faithful and weeping Ubura. The camp deserted, and the porters, gone. I suppose they've taken all the wire wool, <laughs> grumped Henry, feeling some movement of mackerel in his unmentionable and heavily corseted regions. They had. Probably to get the white gloss paint off. God damn it, I suppose I'll have to use bog paper. They haven't nicked it. They had. And all the emergency terps. Oh, Lord of Trousers, grumped Henry. You don't find cactus in the darking continent, do you? Ubura shook his head. Then you'd better find me a haystack or a thatched roof. Damn quick. What will they bugger off for anyway? We are in the land of the terrible king in Didibas. The boys were frightened when they thought of shooting the impi, and they ran away. I'll shoot any damn thing I like, and put it over the mantelpiece, growled Henry. God's teeth! I'm paying them two English shillings a month, and all the berries they can find, and the ingrate sods piss off, hmm? Henry stared at the scattered boxes and moribund fires of what was left of his safari. Hmm. To what do I owe your loyalty? He bellowed. Ubura shuddered and shrugged. You avaricious toad, yelped Sir Henry. Two bob a month when they're anybody's. Sir Henry took stock of the situation. He had a can of corned beef, his shotgun, half a crate, a tin of talcum powder, and a large Christmas unwanted bag of bath salts. It was this last glittering, iridescent item that gave him the great wheeze. It was to prove a mistake. Lead me to this terrible indeed, you squid. Ubura rolled his eyes like dice and came up with an unlucky thirteen. Luck was not a lady that morning. More like a whore, the heart of bath salts. Indeedy, Bass? Yes, indeed, indeedy, roared Henry, now determined on his course. It was to prove a great education. and battled. 
battle scarred warriors held their noses. The tyrant, indeed, he was most impressed with his behavior, and pursuant to a hurried discussion with his ministers, divined that Henry's smell and its effect were an augury of power and mystic strength. I see you, white man, and I see you again, said Ndidi, suspiciously. He says he sees you, Sir Henry Baba, interpreted Ubura. A greeting, sir. Well, good to hear it. At least the fat shit won't want to steal my monocle. Why is he grunting and making all those damn clicking noises, hmm? It is from the tongue of the Hottentots, now a part of the Zulu language. The great king Ndidi does not speak English, Baba. Good grief. This is a part of the empire, isn't it? Well, I'm buggered. Ubura delivered a lengthy, overlauditory paean to the bored black monarch. What are you going on about? Just tell the bugger how did duty and what not, and will he kindly get off his bum and fetch me a large one? Where's the ruddy drinks cabinet anywhere? Henry raised the seat of his field toilet and sat down heavily. He mocked his son Raspberry Brow impatiently. Indeed, he flicked his wildebeest fly switch imperiously and Ubura stopped in mid-praise. And Didi glowered a cold appraisal of Henry and then stared at the mahogany and porcelain throne. Hmm, he grunted, knitting his brows and seaming the whole of his ugly head. He raised his hand. I welcome this strange white King Henry. As one sovereign to another, legally indicated to Henry one of the vast clay pots of royal beer at the base of his dirt mound. Henry grumbled and rose blinking to his feet, staggered forward, peered inside, and frowned terribly. <laughs> he recoiled. Listen, you sweaty clod. If I'd have wanted to piss, I was already settled in the perfect position. Not understanding, indeed he considered this an after you and a kingly gesture of courtesy. A minister filled a goblet with foaming amber fluid. The black king drained it mightily. Mm -hmm. He remarked. Udibi page boy wiped Ndidi's lips with his young head. It is the royal beer. King Henry? Hmm? Well, I suppose it's understandable. He invites you to drink with him. Stronger than the old infamous, huh? Hmm. As Henry quizzed this impossibility, the king himself stooped to fill another goblet. <laughs> said Henry, rudely brushing him aside. Indeed, he froze in terrible unbelief, and 20,000 spears stuttered miniature on oxide shields. Kneeling before the huge clay pot, Henry clasped it as though it were a woman and lifted it to his mouth. There was a silence. The pot contained at least four quarts of potent brew. Henry swallowed the lot pausing only three times for breath. There was a silence. Then Ndidi, his great belly quivering, bellowed his delight. <coughs> Birth, Sir Henry, and with a wave, oh, and um, cheers, I suppose. 20,000 stamping, cheering warriors erupted in cheers from the giant crowd. King Ndidi says he will present you with that garrote. It is a great honor, Baba, whispered Ubura. A ruddy cross? Choked Henry. I know I'm a saintly man, but I'm not the son of God's teeth. And what next? Mount Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the ruddy skulls? Does he think I walked over the lakes? Blasted, I'm not even a bloody Jew boy. 
tell him that, the silly sod. Ubura informed the king that Henry was delighted with his generosity and that the great white king had a gift for the all-powerful Ndidi. Maybe it would be the corned beef. Ndidi signal, and an aged Induna emerged from a large hut bearing a beautiful cloak of leopard skin. Ndidi rose and solemnly placed it about Henry's shoulders. Well, at least it'll keep the chill out on the way to my crucifixion. Kairos, intoned Ndidi. Not if I can help it, you bugger. Henry gave a great eye-rolling shrug of El Greco martyrdom. Tell this sooty, pontious pirate that I'm going to give him some priceless jewels. Ubura looked very puzzled, but did as he was told. Then, to his utter horror, Henry, with a slight and dignified bow, reached into the field toilet, grunted, and placed in indeed his enormous hands the bag of bath salts. Henry screwed his monocle into his left eye, even more astonishing the gross and sweating Ndidi. Then taking one pinky crystal from the spilling bag, he held it to the light. The sun glanced off King Henry's magic eye, and the bath salt danced in reflected glare. Um, groaned an entranced Sir Henry, shaking his head like a great concert. So very sorry to see it pass from the family. With a resigned sigh, he plumped back on the throne, quite overcome. Indeed, he growled with pleasure and horrid noises of feigned expertise and pawnbroker approval. Henry was offered beer, which he accepted with a reluctance bordering on the good manners of a gannet. Also, a huge wooden platter of solids. It was meat of some kind. At the sight of this food, not Roman Catholics, I trust. I'd hate to have garlic on my breath. Woof! Henry worfed. He worfed and ejected a solid shout that convinced the assembled warriors and the king and Didi that this strange white man could speak in rainbows. At home, Henry always said, Grouse before a meal. This here was clearly impossible and a breach of courtesy. Greece, he said, largely, and winked. Hell, he sure ain't squinting, said Indigeny sagely. At the risk of castration or a clubbing, Indigenous generals could only agree. Once more on his feet, a condition Henry equated with only the middle classes, he staggered towards the king. Indeed, he wore a great blue carosse about his naked shoulders and gigantic belly. About his head was a leather ring. Isi koko, said Ndidi, pointing to his head ring and pointing out his manhood. Is he? Belfed Henry. And does he play clarinet? Must say I hate the circus myself. Indeed, he, part educated and part fed on missionaries, rose in misunderstanding. A thousand gleaming angry spears were poised at the Fuhrer of Rawlinson End. Indeed, he stabbed pointedly at his cloak. Karas is mantle of the king, he in turn. This is Blaubock. None left now. All shot out. Just what is left on my body. It lives. It's probably crawling, said Henry. Mind you, a good going out with terms. Indeed, he seemed confused for a moment, then ordered two of his ministers to be buried up to their necks in ant hills. Henry declared in Dee a ruddy good egg. Henry downed the second of the royal pots of beer and collapsed on the throne. You catch my meaning? He mumbled. Indeed, he caught nothing and supervised the clubbing of nine of his wives. <laughs> Burfed Henry through a fog of unseeing. Never let them get on top of you. That's the sure sign of a pervert. Gorgeous maidens advanced on the assembled ranks of warriors. If one of them fellas gets erect, he 
he sure got to get the club in coming. Henry was very fond of clubs. At least it got him away from home. And when he was in London, he usually stayed at the Eurythium. Oh, they all look very erect to me. Stick up bearskin on them. Oh, <laughs> they all in bearskin. But uh, they might make fine guardsmen. Erect? Said indeed. And he gave a mimetic sign to his executioners. It was thus that Henry, in all ignorance, was largely responsible for the end of the Zulu nation. Noting the skull-breaking advances of the executioners, Henry had risen to protest. Damn it! I played rugby at Dr. Arnold's. It was definitely against the rules to raise the clubs above the shoulder or to wear shorts above the knee. I'd say this is all without discipline. Ubura interpreted this to Ndidi, who, having paraded his herds of pure white cattle before this new and strange king, Sir Henry, felt a twinge of shame. To this end, he ordered another 50 warriors executed. Dear God, said Henry, just like Scotland. The terrible king, Ndidi, decided that his audience with this amazing king, Henry, had really been too exhausting, and he needed just a little time in his harem. His 900 wives would soothe him. To show his respect, he offered the now very drunk Henry the finest hut in the royal inner kraal, after his own. Didi was helped to his flat bare feet, and he pointed with his switch to a magnificent round thatched building decorated with cowrie shells. Behind Ndidi, his chief minister bared his gold teeth in anger. It was his heart. Oh, oh, so that's where it is. I was wondering. Oh, thank God I nearly bloody bursting. And before Ubura had time to explain, Henry was barging his way through gaping indunas, witch doctors and ministers, and before he'd even stooped to enter the beautiful beehive hut, he'd already unbuttoned his shorts. When Henry debouched, cursing and burping and wiping his hands down the side of his shorts, it was soft, sudden sable dusk. The inner kraal was almost deserted, only Ubura polishing Henry's throne. Nine gigantic pure white bulls, and also a man with gold teeth who stared with calm hatred at Sir Henry. Behind the high stockaded harem was only quiet, and from the hut of the great wife of Ndidi, nothing but a dreadful snoring. Before the entrance to this great hut stood motionless four heavily muscled royal executioners each with a short stabbing spear, club and axe. Each stood behind their shields and each wore the head ring of great warriors. Having been awarded the head ring meant that they were now fit to marry, have children and settle in their own kraals. That these splendid men chose to remain as bodyguard to their king demonstrated a fierce and marvellous loyalty. Only Ubura understood the niceties of this sacrifice. Do you know they don't have any windows in that bloody place? Yeah, yes, you. I like my privacy in these matters as much as any gentleman, but bugger me, I'd have crawl around on my hands and knees in the ruddy dark looking for that pan. Ubura shook his head sadly. Well, uh, I found it all righty. Fact is, I found three of them. But can you believe this? They were all full. Full? They were bloody brimming. I had to feel my way to my feet and do it up the wall. <laughs> no wonder these wallers catch odd diseases and carry fly swishers. Downright revolting. Don't clean their bogs out. They were not pans, Baba Henry, sir, fluted Ubura. They were pots of the royal beer ordered there by his great majesty for your pleasure. What? Does he think I drink in lavatories? Dear Lord, hospitality? And just where does his gracious majesty think I'm gonna bunk down? 
The blasted bulls! Ubura could only point back to the hut. What? Sleep in the lavatory too? Oh, ear, nose and throat. I'm getting out of this. I'm getting out of this stinking hole before lighting up time. Cockadoodle one says the chicken in his run. Cockadoodle two says the monkey in the zoo. Cockadoodle three says you can come and look at me. But Cockadoodle four says the bars are off the door. Then Cockadoodle five says, I'll eat you all alive.